All that is gold does not glitter. Not all those who wander are lost. The old that is strong does not wither. Deep roots are not reached by the frost. From the ashes a fire shall be woken. A light from the shadows shall spring. Renewed shall be blade that was broken. The crownless again shall be king. J.R. Token. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Inspired Word Cafe. Yay. 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 We have an amazing show tonight. We have one of our own in the IWC Collective that's going to be the featured artist. So, is it Jessica? I think her name is, what's her name again? Jessica LaPlante's going to be our featured poet tonight. So. so when she gets up here, give her lots of love. As I'm telling her, look at nervous in a different way because she's a little nervous, but she's excited. You get to see a beautiful smile. So, But before we do that, I'm going to bring out a young man that it's good to see him out of his crutch. He had injured himself a little while back, and now tonight he's here to dazzle us with one of his poetic writings. So put your hands together. Mr. Cole Mash. I just want to thank Rawl and Aaron for having me tonight. Um, this is awesome. So uh, this, poet's, this poem's called We Haven't Located Ourselves Yet. In the car, we drove alone together. You through Denton and me open mouth dreaming I was on a train to a lodge at the top of the mountain. And if it's you that picks up this bottled letter I threw in the desert, I'm sorry I fell asleep so soon after the gas station and for promising about the rain. In case you're wondering, the title sounds familiar because I stole it from Twin Towns, who stole it from an on the verge of anachronistic DVD. They never returned to an already extinct movie gallery. I took it because I loved its shape. I loved the way it was unashamed to be lost I didn't need a midlife crisis yet because I still had plans to live longer than 50, so I touched it with the kitchen chemical burn on my thumb, cut it out of the TV screen, but sorry again. I kept my eyes on the red sand as long as I could, still car lagged from the trip down. When we lost all hope because Google Maps wouldn't load, you smiled and got lost in all hail West Texas because you love when art imitates life, and my mouth got too dry from frustrated hindsight to stay awake. You figured we had time to go that way. You told me later it sounded like I agreed when you asked. I was snoring. It was the hottest winter on record, so I tunnel vision dreamt. I put all the windows in the sleeper car down for the smell, which, when I realized I was alone, so it was me, made me smile. Sometimes when I hot sun, hard work, sweat, I smell like my only grandpa doing yard work when I was too young to use a stopwatch for the pigeons, and it distracts me like the falling action surrounding a dream shift. All everything changes, but I take no notice of space, only time. When I last changed the oil in a car I sold. How long the bread should rise under the emergency blanket. What time the train took a wrong turn while I slept. As a species, we couldn't know west when the sun didn't set, so we created time out of the sand to identify the thing that kills us. Encase it in cedar with a circular face and shelve it on a mantle. Nice to finally put a name to that shape. You gripped the wheel and I drooled on the window. The minute hand and the speedometer dial cut angles into the late night tracers in your eyes, leapt forward at, to, at what to human sight were identical intervals, but I was still fast escaped. I never needed a compass to find my way back from a dream before. I could always hand and knee stumble over moss because it never crossed my mind that I might not get there, but I couldn't escape on foot this time, couldn't out nightmare the yellow sun. Navigating Texas must have been lonely, with no one awake for you to sit in silence with, but I missed you too when the train stopped at the resort at the top of the mountain. All of my dreams are not at ski cabins, but most of them are, even though I don't ski and never have and haven't spent more than a month aggregate, not linear, at one. I don't know where the ski hill is geographically, as it's not usually taken from real life. Just a snowy place, 
with log buildings that occasionally become the house I grew up in without my noticing, mostly in the dreams, the cabins, like ships that went off course and got wrecked among the sand dunes, are not where I want to exist permanently. The round windows and geometry roofs are not middle, only beginning and or end, either a waking touch on the arm or a couch after the night shift clocking pigeons, or else there's somewhere I'm trying so desperately to leave that I never get away. Thank you. All right, one down and many to go. So, this young lady that's about to come up and share came to us a little while ago wanting to be a part of the Inspired Word Cafe, IWC, and has become such an intricate part. But before that, she showed up wanting to share and was very nervous about it, just as she is tonight. And every time she gets up here, she knocks it out of the park. So I keep telling her, be nervous, be excited. So we're excited because now we get to hear her and hopefully all the viewing audience get to appreciate her. So I invite you to put your hands together and welcome her with your warm heart and a deep embrace for the poetic words of Miss Jessica LaPlante. Hi everybody. The first poem that I have is Coloring Outside the Lines. It's an invitation for creativity. We are all the same on the inside, a template of prepackaged belief systems, unraveling the illusion, parameters of infinitive lines. I can never color inside of these restrictions. Lines are meant to be crossed, colors are meant to bleed together, even if you are slightly broken, you are capable. Broken crayons color the same, they tell me. So before you start judging your own creativity, know that you are a shattered masterpiece spattered on a canvas. You're abstract in your divinity. Yes, we all perceive art differently. We are the supernovas endlessly dancing in the darkness. So I welcome you to risk it all to crumple up the prepackaged belief systems of how life should be, to get out the finger paint, for life is meant to be messy. Your spirit, baby, is an alluring design, so color outside the lines. You were born to be an artist. This is your lifeblood. I invite you to create. You are some piece of work with exquisite taste. This next piece that I have is for the dolphins. There are affiliates here with no dirt on their hands, indirectly linked with dolphin drives, billion dollar industries, high demand. From wild waters I am captured, my pod will be slaughtered or sold. I'm forced to live in a concrete bathtub in which I'm to make my home. They will kidnap others like me, next beluga dolphin prodigy. I appear that I'm always smiling, your viewing pleasure commodity. I'm a sentient educational form with no substance which to educate. I have complex social bonds. Captivity causes me stress and anxiety. I'm forced to swim in endless circles when I used to swim 100 miles a day, forced to jump through hoops for food it's the games that humans like to play. By busloads, children come to watch me, but tell me, what do they learn? I'm a prisoner kept hostage here. My freedom has been overturned. The echoes of people shrieking interrupts my sound location. It feels like explosions in my ears, this torturous vibration. This is just another circus where our survival rate is low. Tell me now who benefits when you buy a ticket for the show. Imagine an open sea pen, sanctuary to be released. For if I can't taste the wild, at least I could live my life in peace. 
Please end this entertainment business disguised as conservation. Let's make the shift Canada and life imprisonment for all cetaceans. <laughs> the next one is about um, addiction. Silhouettes of empty bottles. If pain could write a story, it would draw stains on her forced smile. The stains from nights she just couldn't quite remember. And as she stared in the mirror at her distorted reflection, she saw silhouettes. The silhouettes of empty bottles. The bottles of broken promises. Promises she consumed to ease the hurt. And you see her hands, they were blistered, blistered from the constant knocking, knocking on the doors of, please forgive me. And as she continued knocking, she stood shamefully, standing on the shadows, the shadows of worn out welcome mats, confronted with the signs of, do not solicit. The truth is, they don't want her junk mail here. So she saved up pockets, pockets full of inspired coupons, coupons because she wanted a fair deal. You see, she felt discounted, but she counted for something. But a self-love, something to be bargained for? <laughs> the next one is on a happier note. <laughs> it's called The Journal, and I was just having fun with it. This pen upon the paper feels like secret lover. Thoughts relish into written form, taste like lips upon another. Ink grazes pages softly, sounds like backdoors calling. Seducing thoughts, ink to paper, journal's deepest longing. Mysteries form in mind, revealing what's been written. Sweet release of pen in hand, pen and paper are so smitten. Decode what this means to say, a synonym for fiction. It speaks of secret lover's lips, for humans hardly listen. A fair of pen to paper, feels like secret lover. Thoughts relish into written form, taste like lips upon another. Thank you. All right, we're here with Jessica LaPlante, our lovely floor director. Normally she hides in the back and can hear me mumbling from the background, but tonight you got to share your lovely poetry with us. So thank you for being here. Let's give her a big round of applause for her amazingness. <laughs> right? Right? Very nice. So Jessica, I'm gonna start with my most basic of basic questions, which this one maybe is what terrifies people, I don't know, but something terrifies all of you guys. How did you get started writing poetry? How did I get started? Yeah, when, how, where, what time was it? <laughs> what were you wearing? Those kinds of things. <laughs> I think it was a few different things. Um, when I was in grade six, we were listening to Simon and Garfunkel. Nice. And then getting into I don't know, The Doors influenced me. Cool. Right, poetry and Sarah McLaughlin. You were sober, though. It's fine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> very cool. So you just you d were inspired by other people, and then that was Music. What, music, yeah. mainly. And that's what kind of yeah. led you towards writing. And so had you, did you start writing when you were in grade six? More when I was in high school. It was kind of my like self-therapy. Right. Dealing with stress or dealing with different things going on in high school. Cool, yeah. very cool. And then you've continued this whole entire time or did you find in the last couple of years you've had a resurgence for your love of poetry? Well, for a long period of time, I started rewriting children's songs because I work with children. Cool. And so it was just kind of like Dr. Zeus style right. writing stories and, and songs. Cool. And that, and then came to um, one of your events and mm -hmm. Started writing again. Cool. So happy. And coming out, and then I called you one day and was like, hey, girl, <laughs> you want to be my floor director? She's like, I'm going to think about it and call you back. <laughs> you didn't even know me, and now you're like, oh, that was a, a terrible choice. Now I'm here choice. every week. <laughs> yeah, now, now I find you in my kitchen late at night. I know. I'll stop doing that. 
<laughs> it was one time, you guys. It had been a long night. OK, I can ask you a lot more of these fun questions, except one of them I'm not allowed to ask. Greg's in the back, hoping I won't ask it. OK, what is your favorite word? My favorite word, nostalgia. Nostalgia? Yeah. Yeah? Because yeah. you like, get all nostalgic while you think about it? or Yeah, I just like the word. And serendipity. Serendipity <laughs> is a good word, except I stumble on that word. But I'm not going to say what I say, because it's inappropriate. <laughs> what is your least favorite word? My least favorite word? Oh, I don't know. Anyone. <laughs> First thing that comes to your head, but it has to be PG. It has to be PG. Yeah, apparently. TV. TV, that's true. Your... <laughs> <laughs> so is that is that the word or is is that the actual thing? Like the actual TVs, you hate the TVs or you just hate the word? Is it a, is that a word? Is it a I'd rather watch shows on my computer than on Oh, so TV. you love the word laptop, but you can't <laughs> handle the word TV. <laughs> sure. Right, sure. She's like, "Okay, whatever you say, Ern. Let's just get this over with." Um, <laughs> what turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? The Alpine. Oh, yeah? yeah. Tell me more. I love hiking into the Alpine where cool. there's no people and you just hear nature. Very cool. And, and you're waterfalls. really tired by the time you get there, so it's really yeah. worth it. It's worth it. That's worth awesome. Worth the view. We did a big Alpine hike when I was about 20 weeks pregnant with our first daughter. We didn't know it was going to be quite so intense, but the best part was that I didn't even finish last. My husband was, like, way behind us. <laughs> it was like the whole rest of his family didn't join. It was with his, his in-laws, and they were all like, no, we're not doing that. We don't do that. We're the Scott family. We're, all, we're sitting here and having beers. See you in a couple hours. And he's trekking up the way but it was it was once we got there we could see the entire backside of Whistler we were up near um Lillooet and it was like epic and amazing and totally worth struggling up a hill for three hours that's <laughs> so funny I'm guessing that that's what yeah oh well yeah I'm a trooper so I wasn't that <laughs> pregnant yet <laughs> 20 weeks I still had just a little belly 40 weeks, it would have been a different story. They would have been like huffing me up on a horse. Okay, here we go, wide load. Okay. <laughs> what turns you off? Fickleness. When people are fickle. Yeah. Just they gotta be genuine. Genuine. Cool. Okay, <laughs> let's do every, every other, okay. All of the rest of the questions you can only answer with one word, because I think word. you'd be really good at this. Okay. <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? Songbirds. Oh, she's doing it. She's serious. Okay. <laughs> what sound or noise do you hate? Whining. Whining. Oh, I'm with you, girlfriend. <laughs> That's my whole life. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? World traveler. <laughs> World traveler, that is two words. That are traveling. They're traveling, there we go, there we go. <laughs> We've picked a theme and we're sticking to it. What profession would you not like to do? One word. I'm kidding, it's a loose rule. Slaughterhouse. Oh. I man. would not want to work at a slaughterhouse. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> and people who do, you have to say, I will see you another time. Thank you for coming over. We'll talk later. Right? <laughs> I work at a slaughterhouse and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Worrying. <laughs> Worrying. <laughs> if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? This one doesn't have to be one word. <laughs> Welcome to the soul bar. Oh. And what is he serving at the soul bar? That's what I want to know. Souls? Uh oh. <laughs> Maybe he has some good kombucha. Oh, oh. there we go. <laughs> kombucha, yes. SCOBY, you guys, if you don't know about it. What is it? Symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. That's what it stands for. And it literally grows in tea. It's good Get for you. Some. Jessica makes it. It's really good. It's awesome. And they but give you some. It looks like there's an alien in your drink, though. So well, you guys will know. Google it when you get home. Okay. 
So I'm going to ask you one of my uh, questions that I really love to ask people because I, I really feel like it enlightens me as to who this person is, right? And I'm trying so hard to be serious. <laughs> it's serious. <clears throat> Jessica. Yes, Erin. <laughs> if you were a vegetable, what vegetable would you be? I'd be all of them. <laughs> all of them? Like, you'd be like a GMO vegetable. <laughs> I'd be a juice. <laughs> a juice. Oh, yeah. hey, that's a good answer. Some juiced so you, vegetables. You would be processed once you, you'd already been smushed. Yeah. Multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> and all of your pulp and insides have been removed, and it's just your blood left, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> all right. Well, we know what Jessica gets up to on the weekend. Okay, you guys. <laughs> I'm going to wrap my interview now with Jessica. Thank you for allowing me Thanks. to you know, do my thing with you. Let's give Jessica a big, big thank you for being here with us and for being subjected to me. So, Jessica. Our next performer is a friend of mine. He's a student up at the University of British Columbia, which is cool. <laughs> um, it is cool, you guys. It is. It's an inside story. I'll tell you all later. But he's a really cool guy, and he's a, we always have poets, but he writes fiction, and fiction is super awesome. It's one of my favorite things to read. And so I'm going to just stop now and bring him to the stage, and he can do the talking for himself. His name is Connell, and he's going to come up and do some fiction. All right, so uh, I've just got like a little piece here. It's from a novel I'm working on uh, called Kids Under the Stairs. Um, and basically, all you have to know is the, the character, his name's James, he's out on the streets, and he's looking for this guy whose name is Ito. And that's pretty much all you have to know. Evening, and the towers in the hills are lit with a strange spectral light, as if they are powered by something far worse than the sun. I could try to leave this valley, but the city is my home. On the other side of those walls, I'm just another wastey, another dry mouth in a desert. On the hood of a car, I write out my two options in the settled dust. Find Ito, or turn yourself in. I look at the words so long, they start to become a line of fuzzy black caterpillars. I draw a line under find Ito, get my share of the takings. At least I wouldn't have to eat garbage anymore. Ever looked at mold? I mean, really looked at it? It's not just a squishy mess. There's a structure there in the fungus, a radial plan in blue and green. The city is like that. It's wormy with tunnels and condemned areas, condemned but still growing full of homeless, wasties, who managed to sneak their way over the valley walls or under them. An abandoned shopping mall crawls with petty dealers, drunks, scratch addicts like bald, twitchy chickens, bag ladies packing their homes on their backs, $20 prostitutes. All right, tough guy, it's time to find Ito. I expect to be confronted, but no one gives me a second glance. I'm part of this now, this passively rotting underbelly. One woman is covered in reptilian scales, a costume or a side effect of a treatment gone bad. There's no way to tell. There is a man missing his leg, a veteran. He's got a blanket laid out beside him with artifacts from the Civil War, a drone wing, bullets, bits of twisted metal, and a t-shirt of the city's flag in the shape of a gun, boasting the slogan, these colors never run, and another with survival of the freest. It used to be that the world was a place of magic. The forests were enchanted. Nymphs frolicking by the riversides. We humans were but bit players in a great epic, the whole cosmos shaking with the battle between good and evil. Now, we live inside a manufactured landscape, the whole thing planned by humans, a great machine grinding up forests, mountains, flesh. So when I say that we're prisoners of our own minds, you'll know what I mean. There's nothing left that isn't, that isn't the product of human thought. There is no wild. Even our own bodies have been cut up, stitched back together, remade according to the logic of the system. We've cut down the enchanted forests. We've created the world, which means that all the monsters out there are our own creation. Do any of these scrubs even know, Ido? Feeling like the safety's gone off, I go around and just ask them, this guy owes you money? Hey, why don't you put up a flyer, man? One man has deformed hands like flippers with all the fingers fused together. He puts out his hand for payment, Give me something to help me remember, he says, but I've got nothing for him. Wasting my time, gonna make me miss the shelter cut off, the man grumbles. I think about grabbing the freak, slamming him against the wall, cracking what he knows out of his head like yolk from an egg, 
but there's something sickly and rotten about him, and I can't bring myself to grab hold of his arms or to touch those deformed hands. He joins up with a mob of people making their way out of the shuttered mall towards the shelters. I've learned that there are city shelters and there are religious shelters. The city shelters have the most beds, but they'll tag you, scan your eyeballs, take DNA samples, and a lot of us out here, well, we'd prefer to remain lost. The call waiting shelters are a popular choice. Sometimes they'll even give you a little hit of their basco as part of their religious ceremonies. I've avoided them though, preferring to spend the nights walking. The flipper-handed man, he grabs my shoulder and he laughs as I pull back from the touch of his deformed hands on my sunburned skin. You coming? If you ain't got money, there's other things you can do for me. His freakish hand needs the muscles on my shoulder. He shrugs and he follows the group out. The people bunch together as if they might be set upon. The hardness of the city is the hardness of our souls. We are no better or worse than this world that we've created. I go down a broken escalator into the hollowed out heart of the mall. A banner reads, wealth, wellness, water, the city's motto. There is a group of kids gathered around a fountain in the center of a plaza. The fountain is dry now and full up with trash, smashed pipes, cigarettes, condoms, pants, waste of all kinds. The kids are burning, them, burning something at the bottom of the fountain and the shadows run up the walls. I move into the darkness and I grab a kid, young with a mess of black hair. He worms about, but I pull him down a hallway away from the fire, my hand over his mouth. His friends don't notice. Enough messing around already. Someone here knows Ito. I show the kid my knife, a cruel piece with a serrated blade. His face goes dark. Ito, he says. Yeah, I know him. He's one of the mad dogs. What's that, a gang? The kid gives me a look. He laughs, even as I hold my knife in front of his face. His eyes huge, shining in the near dark. You don't know who the mad dogs are? Man. He trails off, staggered by my ignorance. I let go of the kid, but I keep him backed up against the wall. I'm new. Tell me about them. They're a gang? Yeah, sure, they're a gang. They're a wasty gang. Who's in charge, Ito? Nah, man, he's just a dealer. Mad dog's in charge. Crazy guy with a face like raw meat. You don't want nothing to do with him. Someday he's handing out money like he's God on earth, and the next day he's burning some poor guy alive. It happened right over there. Or right over there. The kid nods in the direction of the pit. Firelight dances at the end of the hallway. There are voices and the smell of burnt chemicals. The kid looks at me, afraid. His eyes are unafraid. His eyes aren't right. They're too big. They're too protruding. He must be high. Awesome. Oh, hi, Raul. Hi, Aaron. I think I'm taller than you right now, so good thing you can hide behind me like a, a little petite thing. Aww. Can I ask them a question? What do you guys think of uh, having a fiction reader writer at the show. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We need more. No, it was awesome. You should just come out all the time and, and read like the whole thing. Yeah, your whole novel that you're doing for your masters, just read that. I, I think just give little teases like that because I don't know if you're watching, I was watching Taking Picture, everyone's like, it's really cool. It kind of takes us back to a time when right. we sat as a kid growing up listening to the radio set, set, you know, Sunday night in bed and you're listening to Masterpiece Theater or something like that. Yeah, that happened in my childhood too. <laughs> <laughs> Why yeah. are you here? <laughs> Why are you here? You're the one lurking behind me on the stage. Well, we're co-hosts. Con anyway, guys, give Cole a... Uh, yeah, Connor another... Connell! Well, they're both wearing the same shirt. I'm confused. <laughs> give Connor... Connell, he can't even, he's done, he's done. We've cut him from the show. You can find more of us at inspiredwordcafe.com or on Facebook, and that's a wrap for our show tonight. Thank you guys so much for coming out. See you guys.